probably the most simple example is that how you exercise power and influence. Um, if you're an African American man, you don't have the right to get angry in an organization. I mean, if you do, even one time, you're always the angry black man regardless. And so you gotta figure out how can you show displeasure in a way which is dispassionate enough so that you don't get labeled with that. And you also have to find a way to how do you deal with the fact that you're required to keep all of that bottled up inside, um, which, you know, Price Cobb wrote his book on black rage in the 60s, um, highlighting that. Because you, when you hold all that in and you're not given license to let it out, that's a challenge. I think it's a great conversation in some senses. I mean, at least it, it raises the fact that people can be discriminatory without um, conscious intent. Now then, with that said, um, I think that when I look at most organizations, they're doing all these tr trainings, um, trying to deal with it as if this is an individual problem. And while unconscious bias is held individually, the fact of the matter is we don't recognize it. It's unconscious. And so probably from an institutional or organizational perspective, the only way to counterbalance that is with structural organizational responses. And no one's talking about that. So people are saying, well, look, if I can teach everyone to recognize that, yes, I have unconscious bias, um, and I'm going to do my best in the right situations to counterbalance that, even though I would argue you can never do it because it's unconscious, um, that just doesn't work. It's just not going to work. But then worse, what it does is it gives people license. Because people say, to the extent that I have an unconscious bias based upon race, gender, the fact that I went to Harvard in a previous life, so I'm going to like folks from there better than I like folks from Stanford, although I actually have a Stanford undergrad, so I actually like Stanford folks better. With that license, it becomes um, much harder to get people to say, well, wait a minute, are we going to find organizational responses which deal with it? Because it's like, look, I'm not responsible for it. I can't be blamed for it. So why should I change my whole company to fix it? I got started in this work um, because I was doing some random research as a graduate student at Stanford, and I looked at inequities that were happening around women and their promotion rates. Um, and I came up with this hypothesis around um, organizational commitment and how that might impact it, which ultimately became my dissertation. I did in-group favoritism, blah, blah. All this stuff that ends up being unconscious bias. Um, and when I saw that inequity and I started looking across other areas and seeing that same pattern kind of existed, I really wanted to find a way where I could convey the message that this is real in a very rigorous way. I mean, my previous training was an engineer, so I'm like, look, I want to work really hard to convince the world that, with the thought that if you do that kind of research, you present that type of data, that that would be able to move the world. Um, 20 some odd years later, still in the fight, still trying to find ways to do it. We're still trying to increase the amount of information that's available. I mean, I'm seeing some progress, but not nearly as much um, as we need, especially given the fact that the demographics are changing much more quickly than the progress is happening.